good evening to everyone and welcome to this program. Minnesota Citizens for Clean Elections, occasionally known as Clean Elections Minnesota, is the sponsor of tonight's program. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that promotes election policies that reflect the will of the people and not the power of big money. You can find us at cleanelectionsmn.org. Please take a look. We have co-sponsors and they are Common Cause Minnesota, American Promise, Plymouth Area Indivisible, Move to Amend, the Minnesota Peace Project, and Indivisible Men 03. Connie Lewis and Ken Peterson of Clean Elections organized this program and did a terrific job. We have over 200 participants tonight, and that's an excellent turnout. Um, that is no doubt due to our speaker tonight, Nancy McLean, who is the William H. Chaffee Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University. She is the author of Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Rights Stealth Plan for America. We all wondered at some point, how did we get into the political and economic mess that we find ourselves in today? Professor McLean's carefully researched book answers that question and explains how a libertarian minority has achieved control of our government to the exclusion of most of us. It was no accident. This is a very important book for the future of democracy and an Fortunately, it's also a fun book to read. Please reward Professor McLean for her very significant accomplishment by buying a copy of the book. If you look in the chat column, the chat screen, you will find a link that will allow, allow you to purchase the book. And of course, it's available at your independent bookstore. Um, all right, here's a visual. Visual. There it is. Don't make a mistake and get the wrong book. Our moderator this evening is Dave Hoggy, a recently retired Pulitzer Prize winning journalist with the Star Tribune. And uh, Dave and Professor McLean, take it away. All right, thank you, George. Professor McLean, this is such a terrific book and I'm delighted to be here with you tonight to talk about it. So let's plunge right in. Your book describes a conservative political project in our country whose goal is not just to shrink government or cut taxes, but to fundamentally rewrite the rules of democracy in a way that would frustrate majority rule and allow a wealthy minority, a wealthy elite to govern the country. Tell us a little bit about how you arrived at this thesis. Yes, uh, thank you, Dave. And thank you for uh, being the uh, interviewer tonight. It's an honor to be with you. And I wanna thank Connie and Ken and all the others who worked hard uh, to make this event happen. Um, too bad we couldn't do it in person, but it's great to be with you. Uh, so uh, that question is an interesting one because there isn't a simple answer. This is quite the shaggy dog story about how I arrived at these conclusions. I was actually working my way forward uh, from some problems in the history and I was actually stunned when I began to conclude exactly uh, what you've described, that the goal of this project from this far right, you know, corporate funded libertarian minority is not just to shrink government, but to actually rig the rules of our democracy so that a majority program can advance. And if anyone on this uh, has ever watched Homeland <laughs> and remembers the cl character Claire Danes, who would see these things uh, happening, and then uh, you know in the world and see these kind of terrorist plots and these connections with between people. There was a moment uh, in in about 2012 um, that I started to feel like that character, and I thought this can't possibly be true. No one would have the audacity to try to do something like this. I don't care how rich they are, how much power they have. It, 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 it's impossible to 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 think that this could be happening. But in fact, that was before I got into the key archives that I used uh, in this project. And I then found out that in fact, what I was thinking was true. And this is a minority arch-right section 
generation of the uh, capitalist class in this country led by Charles Koch uh, doesn't represent all but represents some very significant uh, wealthy individuals and particularly individuals based in the fossil fuel sector. I think it's important to note who believed and they could look and see that democracy was becoming more inclusive and moving away from the kinds of values that they held dear uh, and they were feeling like they would not be able to control it if they didn't do something quite radical quite quickly. And so Charles Koch had been thinking about these things uh, since the 1970s, but it was really in the late 1990s um, after the Kyoto Accords, the motor voter legislation to create a more inclusive elect uh, electorate, uh, the Global Tobacco Treaty, all of these things led him to a kind of a very shrewd and sophisticated, but essentially a Hail Mary pass <laughs> to try to rig the rules of our democracy. And he was advised by a figure that I'm sure we'll talk a bit about, but who, who actually advised uh, Charles Koch and these other donors um, that if you don't like the outcome of public policy over a long period of time, stop focusing on who rules and start thinking about the rules and how you can change those rules to get the outcomes that you want. So this is essentially uh, the story that I found and, I, and the most important finding of the book is, uh, well, two things I guess I'd say. First, to see them saying this kind of thing in their own words, but secondly, uh, to see them saying it in the knowledge that they have a tiny minority agenda to create a kind of world that the rest of us would not want to inhabit. And that is why they must spread disinformation and why they must rig the rules in ways that I'm sure we'll talk about. Sure. At the heart of your book is a, a very conservative economist named James Buchanan. He won the Nobel Prize for economics, but he's mainly known for his affiliation with conservative institutions such as George Mason University. Tell us a little bit about Buchanan, his, his personal background, and how he developed this very conservative theory of political economy. Yes, uh, Buchanan, you, most of you probably have not heard of him, uh, and don't feel bad, neither had I when I came across him in the archives, um, but I came to learn that he was a very significant figure uh, in the um, kind of uh, free market fundamentalist kind of milieu, the, the arch, arch right economic liberty uh, camp. And he was actually uh, a Southerner born in a, a small rural hamlet, Gum, Tennessee, uh, in the depression uh, to a farm family of, of some means, uh, had, a, had a kind of significant family. Uh, but he went on to graduate school in economics at the University of Chicago, where of course Milton Friedman and, and others were working after uh, a service in the Navy in World War II. And this described himself as being converted, you know, and sort of seeing the light and getting into this new world. And he came back to Virginia, to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville uh, in 1956 with a mission to create an outpost for this free market fundamentalist project in Virginia. He actually had funding from an organization which is the precursor to one of Charles Koch's favorite philanthropies now, something called the Institute for Humane Studies. Uh, but he arrived in Virginia just as the state's right-wing white elite was pushing through a program of massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And that is where he put his marker to push for school privatization, uh, which was the leading demand of the massive resistors to Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and he made his case on economic grounds, not on racial grounds, but on economic grounds, but he was serving uh, that cause. And so I became intrigued and began to look into him and found that he had been this kind of quiet bit player over decades, as you say, on the political right, connected with almost every single organization, uh, think tank, um, uh, donor outfit, et cetera, on the political right. And I think of him as kind of the I think of him and Milton Friedman as kind of the yin and the yang of this project. You know, Friedman was this sunny, outgoing character, never said anything in, in print that he wouldn't say in public, as near as I could tell, going through his archives. Buchanan was very, very different, was a much darker figure, uh, much, much more dour approach to things. And he basically brought to this free market project the idea that if you really wanted to destroy the kind of liberal state created over the 20th century that does things like social security, workers' rights, environmental protection, women's rights, civil rights, 
you can't just make a case for the market. You have to make a case against government. And you have to convince people that government cannot do the things it says it's going to, um, that everybody involved in government is a self-seeking individual. Um, and then you also have to think about how this um, expanded government grew up and therefore how you might unwind it by, by rigging the rules. So very, very interesting figure, uh, but it did take me some time to realize that he was the one to watch. There's a very striking passage early in your book where you describe Buchanan's view of taxation and, and your description is so fair and so balanced that it almost makes it seem plausible. But Buchanan felt that it's unfair in a democracy when a wealthy minority are forced to pay high taxes for the things that the majority wants, like public schools and good roads. He thought this was really unjust. Can you tell us how he arrived at that philosophy? And can you tell us what's the flaw in that argument? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I felt like I was entering an alternate universe when I was doing this research. Right. So I did really try to be fair and to read, you know, the ideas and the history, the sources and everything as, as, as uh, closely as I could. But in the end, it is just such a dark and toxic vision. And I actually realized that it traces back that particular view that um, exploitation in a society comes from the government, not from any other source, not from economic actors, but it actually traces back to John C. Calhoun, the mm. pro-slavery U.S. Senator who mm. wrote two big disquisitions on government and actually said, you, you got to, to get the, this project, you need to understand, you got to think about this. Calhoun was a, a, an enslaver, right? He owned men, women, and children uh, who, who worked uh, the family's lands. And he said that exploitation came from those yeomen in the countryside who wanted government to build roads so they could get their goods to market, to have schools for their kids. So this was exploitation, what the yeomen were doing to the slaveholders, whereas what the slaveholders were doing to the enslaved, that was just private property, right? Yeah. Um, and capitalism. So, so it is really wow. quite a set of ideas, but for those who believe it, um, they tend to be uh, deeply immersed to this. It's a, libertarianism is an overwhelmingly uh, white cause and an overwhelmingly male cause. You know, there's a few African-Americans and a few women, but mostly it's, it's guys who can imagine thinking this way, right? That everybody else is out to get them and that they, everything they have, they deserve. And that there are these grabbing Ooh. hands, these moochers trying to take away uh, uh, what they've earned. So it, it's quite a, um, a chilling philosophy, but I think we have to realize that many people believe this deeply. The likes of Charles Koch believe this deeply, that they're being exploited by their fellow citizens. Um, and understanding that mentality, I think, is crucial to being able to effectively um, combat what they're doing to our society. When we think of some of the things that we take for granted in our government today, um, occupational uh, safety regulation, environmental regulation, safety net programs such as Social Security and Medicare, high quality public schools. What was, the, what was Buchanan's view um, uh, of the legitimacy of these forms of government? basically that they are illegitimate. Um, and again, it took me a while to, to, to really realize what, what was being said in these sources, um, because again, it's just so alien, I think, to most of us. But the idea is that um, government has only three legitimate functions. So it must um, uh, protect, um, uh, provide for the national defense, ensure the rule of law, and guarantee social order. So in short, armies, courts, and police. <laughs> Beyond that, they believe government has no business going uh, and no right to coerce uh, citizens who don't agree with it. So that's how they would make a positive spin on this is to say that we should all be free individuals and that um, workers coming together in labor unions is an uh, unwarranted uh, use of collective coercive power. And again, remember, they don't recognize that companies like Amazon or GM in its day or the fossil fuel companies that they have any power. It's just citizens coming together, uh, having power that's a problem. Uh, and then pro 
programs like Social Security, Medicare, food stamps, all of these things that are social insurance that came to us from ideas in the progressive era and the New Deal, they see those as coercive. And Buchanan used to make his example this way. He, he had no children and he would say, why should I have to pay for ballet lessons for someone else's children? <laughs> so it was, it was that aggressive. Um, and so he would say the same thing about Social Security, Medicare, you know, sure, people should have retirement insurance, sure, they should have uh, Medicare, but only if they provided it for themselves only if they are saving an individual savings account. So that's why we hear all that language of individual savings accounts. And basically what that ignores is the whole history of the 20th century, <laughs> that in societies that are deeply unequal, people can't do that. And, and by pooling risk, we make all of us safer and more secure. Right, right, right. You touched on education and Brown versus Board of Education a moment ago. Buchanan first came to public attention in the 1950s, I think in the wake of uh, uh, Brown versus Board, um, when he proposed what we would now call a voucher system for K through 12 education in segregated Virginia. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder, was Buchanan a racist? And is this ultra libertarian project that he and, and Koch engineered, is it inherently racist? Yeah, I mean, I think to, to answer that question, um, we might need to kind of pull back from the way a lot of Americans um, have talked about racism for a long time, so that racism is kind of a sin of the heart, right, that an individual has. And I think one thing that the movement for Black Lives, you know, and all the years of organizing among African Americans that it's built on has taught us is that racism is structural. It is systemic. Its worst damage is done when there is cumulative inequality that's perpetuated over generations and people are cut off from the resources that would enable them to have autonomy and what their an opportunity in their lives. So I never found Buchanan saying anything really aggressively racist, right? And so I, I don't, I, you know, I basically said I, he didn't seem any more racist than a white conservative of his generation would be. And I was very comfortable with that statement, although the libertarian, you know, coke funded academics went crazy about it. But, um, but to me, there's a, almost like something basic, um, a basic human truth here, which is that no one could have advanced the program that he advanced. And Milton Friedman was also doing this at the same time. And some of their other friends were enraptured with what was going on in Virginia. No one could have put forward these ideas if they actually cared about uh, the well-being of African Americans in the South who were disenfranchised, who had been victims of systemic racism, uh, and who were finally, as a result of the Brown decision, getting citizenship recognized and getting a chance for their children to have a uh, uh, good education. And what this project did, this economic liberty project coming together with the segregationists in the way that it did is cut that opportunity off right at, at, the, at, at the moment when it was breaking through and leave us with this very incredibly divided system that has continued uh, to ex exclude, subordinate, stigmatize African-Americans. So to me, it's almost worse, <laughs> frankly, if he didn't believe in racism because he was willing to inflict that on people to move this uh, libertarian economic program. When we think about one high tide of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, uh, the passage of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, were these triggering events for uh, Buchanan and the conservative movement to say, uh, okay, government has gone too far in an effort to intercede in private affairs? Yes, absolutely. There's a whole string of, of triggering events, as you put it, over the years. And uh, the Barry Goldwater campaign mm -hmm. in 1964 was the voice of that. Um, and Buchanan was a supporter. He actually took over his colleagues' classes so his colleague could go and work on Milton Friedman's campaign as an economic uh, advisor. Milton Friedman was also on the advising team. So they all thought Barry Goldwater was their candidate. And you have to remember, Barry Goldwater 
argued for privatizing Social Security. He argued for privatizing the Tennessee Valley Authority that had brought rural electrification uh, to people. He argued against the minimum wage, you know, argued for these school vouchers. So basically the whole kind of program we see now was um, part of the Barry Goldwater campaign. And also the John Birch Society supported the Barry Goldwater campaign. And of course, uh, Charles Koch's father, Fred Koch was a founding member of the John Birch Society and Charles Koch was a member of the John Birch Society until uh, later in the 1960s uh, as, a, as a younger man then. So absolutely, there is a backlash against that. And that is the continuing position of these people. They don't advertise it because they know it's unpopular, but they have always opposed anti-discrimination laws, any kind of affirmative action program, all of these things, again, saying that they're infringements on the liberty of the individual, the employer, uh, most, most um, specifically in the case of the Civil Rights Act. Let's roll the clock forward a bit. And let me ask you, how did Charles Koch first become acquainted with Buchanan and with this ultra conservative libertarian uh, strain of intellectual political economy? And then how yeah. did they uh, form a partnership, so to speak? Buchanan began to make a name for himself uh, as uh, in reaction against another set of, of these uh, triggering events, which was the campus unrest of the 1960s. First, the movement to desegregate higher education uh, and to bring women in, and then the anti-Vietnam War movement. And he actually was in California for a year where he advised Governor Reagan, started to work with Reagan's conciliary, Ed Meese, uh, who is still deep into this project. Uh, so, and, and they reprinted um, Charles Koch, what was then the Charles Koch, uh, or no, it was the, um, I haven't looked at this stuff in a while, the um, uh, Committee for Independent Education, uh, mm -hmm. which was pushing private schooling, uh, reprinted some of Buchanan's writings and speeches in this era. And then he got to know Charles Koch. And then when Charles Koch uh, set to work in the 1970s, building what eventually became the Cato Institute and holding all these obscure seminars on Austrian economics, his favorite thing, uh, he would invite Buchanan to participate in those. So Buchanan was involved in all the institution building uh, that went on in the 1970s and was actually pushing for it, saying that the right needed a counterintelligentsia and that they should create, his words, a gravy train to do okay. this that would be funded by these corporate donors. Throughout American history, there have been quite a series of these elitist projects, which you know presume that there's a special elite that could run the world, run our country better than others. One thinks of the Trilateral Commission, for example. What sets the Koch donor network apart? What are the mm -hmm. tools, the institutions, um, that they've established to extend the influence of their ideas and actually affect policy and change the country? And, ha yeah. and have they been successful at it? Yes, this is such an audacious project. As I said, uh, it, it took me a long time to realize just how extensive it was. There was a lot of nausea in there as I'd, you know, I'd come across some new group and I'd say, oh no, you know, and I'd start looking it up and it's like, sure enough, these people all trained at George Mason, you know, they went off to staff these groups. So at this point, there are literally hundreds of organizations that are funded by this Koch donor network. You sometimes hear them referred to as the seminar network, uh, mm -hmm. but since um, 2009, when they started trying to attract other donors, they have built up a base of over 600 donors who give a minimum of 100,000 a year for this political project. So they have more than, you know, they, they, they rival the political parties in off years, have more than, uh, than the, the Republican party. Uh, um, two social scientists have also tracked this very well, Data Scotch Poll and um, Alexander Hertel Fernandez, and also a wonderful research group called T True North. But yeah, so the scale of the spending is astonishing, but they are funding, again, literally hundreds of groups that are ostensibly independent, but in fact are part of an integrated strategy. So those groups, just to give you, you know, a sample, include, of course, the Cato Institute, which used to be the Charles Koch Foundation, uh, the Heritage Foundation, the Federalist Society, Americans for Prosperity, um, uh, uh, the 
uh, state policy network, which has affiliates in the states around the country, including um, two in Minnesota, the Freedom Foundation of Minnesota and the Center for the American Experiment. You, of course, also have a state chapter of Americans for Prosperity uh, and Coke Seed Money in uh, two of the University of Minnesota campuses at Minneapolis and Duluth. So this is, it's so sophisticated. I mean, you got to give them credit for that, right? But right. I mean, there are donor groups, there are think tanks, there are organizing enterprises, there are efforts to change the courts, um, there are uh, international wings. I mean, they really, really have put quite a lot into this. And that is why I think it's so important that people really understand the ideas driving this, what the strategy is, what the end game is, um, because we really need that to deal effectively with it. We have some great questions coming in from the audience about what's happening right now in our country. But before I move to those, let me ask one more question. You've described this very elaborate, very costly network that they've established. Are they winning? Are they getting what they want in our country? They have made pretty astonishing project uh, progress, actually, um, pretty breathtaking. So it is extremely um, uh, far along. Um, and, and I quote them, you know, the kind of gloating in the book where they talk about how effective it's been. Uh, one thing that they did that was very shrewd was to focus on the states. So I think many liberals tend to focus on uh, the federal government and maybe more committed people on local government. But for a long time, not many people on the progressive side were focusing much on the state government. And so uh, during the Obama administration, Democrats lost a ton of seats in state legislatures and the uh, this radicalized Republican Party pushed to the right by the donors um, was able to take control of many state governments like mine in North Carolina um, and also the one where I went to graduate school in Wisconsin under Scott Walker and huh. using control over the state legislatures, they pushed through all these radical rules changes Changes. The attacks on public sector unions, taking away collective bargaining rights, the uh, voter suppression measures, the extreme gerrymandering, the likes of which we've never seen <laughs> with the kind of sophistication and determination uh, that they showed in that, and many, many other rules changes. Um, and so again, I think once you understand this as being a project of a group that really understands it's a minority, and it doesn't know where it's getting replacements from, right? <laughs> because they've alienated the young people. The country is changing to become more inclusive. That is why they are holding on so doggedly with a Leninist-like discipline um, to make sure that they can rig these rules and keep themselves in power. And I forgot to say the most obvious huge thing, but Citizens United. That was a long-term project of uh, Charles Koch and, and the, you know, the intellectuals and uh, litigators around him to make sure that they could open the spigots to money and politics. Uh, so that has been huge. Are they honest about what they're trying to do or is there a certain amount of subterfuge? Uh, you've talked about how yeah. many Americans simply would not accept mm -hmm. the values of this organization if, if the public knew about it. So is there a little subterfuge here? There's absolutely subterfuge, which is why my subtitle has stealth yeah. uh, in it. And, and perhaps the first element of subterfuge to point to is the reliance on systematic disinformation. So the Coke Network worked with the tobacco companies uh, in the 1980s, kind of perfecting these operations in the 80s and 90s uh, to shield the tobacco industry from uh, challenges, right? And to try to summon up what became uh, Americans for Prosperity Today, a kind of ground army out in the states and the legislative districts to fight for the tobacco uh, industry and other embattled corporations. Now, of course, they're using that for, for fossil fuel. But to do that, they have pushed disinformation, certainly disinformation about climate change, you know, most obviously and prominently recently, but also the myth of mass voter fraud so that they can get support for suppressing the vote. Because you can't just go to the public and say, hey, we'd li like to keep a lot of folks from voting because we don't think they should. They don't share our interests and they won't support our policies. But if you convince people that there's terrible fraud, you know, that which doesn't exist, but if you, you put that case out, then you can win. So they use uh, the, the disinformation. They also um, are very good. And again, if you're this wealthy, you can hire focus groups, you can think about messaging and strategy. But 
I wouldn't say that, you know, it's not so much that they lie as that they try to cloud the truth or not give the whole truth. So for example, when they talk about social security, they talk about reforming social security, but our journalists haven't known that they really wanna destroy social security. So the journalists don't even think to ask, are you in favor of the original principle of social uh, social security, which is social insurance? And so they get away with kind of masquerading what they're doing, which is actually destruction as reform. Uh, so that's another um, example. And I will say um, I, have gotten on the mailing list of Americans for Prosperity, so I know what they say to their people. And they always um, uh, spin things in a way that makes it sound like it's in the self-interest of the grassroots Republican voter. So mm. when the Koch uh, network team was working daily, they boasted with the Trump administration to shape that uh, tax giveaway to the wealthiest Americans and to put all these time bombs in uh, our tax system, what they said to their grassroots people is is do you want to keep more of your hard-earned dollars in your own pocket? Do you want to limit government? Then call your legislator, you know, do this, do that. So, so I would say it's more the, the manipulation through withholding information or, you know, creating um, a false picture rather than like something where you could say, oh, that's an absolute lie. We have a terrific question from the audience here. Uh, hang on to your hat. Are you willing to hazard a guess whether Donald Trump is a conscious member of um, this program or did he just stumble into it? Um, so Donald Trump uh, is, is interesting to think about this um, uh, because uh, put them together because again, I think this is where a, 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 a falling down, not among all, but among many journalists and news editors, that ever since Donald Trump came on the scene, it's been Donald Trump all the time, right? He dominates every news cycle. And so they're not asking most of them the questions they should be asking about the relationships here. So Donald Trump is such a, you know, um, <laughs> words fail. Um, such a distinctive figure. I mean, I don't think he cares about ideas in the sense that any of us would. He clearly doesn't read. So I don't think he's ideologically committed in the ways that they are, but he certainly wants to defend the interests of the most wealthy, you know, as they would say, the, the makers. Uh, and he certainly has these um, ideas about IQ and about who's fit and who's not fit, which are often associated with this libertarian project. So I don't know what, what is actually in his head about this, but I can tell you that his administration from the very beginning has been stalked by major figures from the Koch network. Um, his original uh, White House liaison to con uh, Congress, Mark Short, um, uh, was um, the uh, head of Freedom Partners Chamber of Commerce. They're one of their main uh, donor groups for five years uh, before he went into that role. Donald McGahn, who uh, was choosing the Supreme Court justices and overseeing the nomination process, was deeply involved in the Koch network uh, for years before doing that. Mike Pence, the vice president, of course, is deeply involved in this. So I, you know, I don't know who knows what Donald Trump knows, but I think what we do know is that he really is not interested in governing, right? He wants to stay in the, the White House residence and watch Fox News and see, you know, see how his businesses are going and his reputation. And so he has essentially outsourced the work of government to a combination of these um, uh, arch right, you know, economic liberty advocates and the likes of Stephen Miller, right? The, the white nationalist kind of type. So, and, and systematically um, uh, pushed out and uh, uh, diminished and degraded career civil servants. So um, yeah, I, I look forward to the work of future journalists and historians who will have access to the inside records. But I can say another thing too, is that um, Charles Koch has been a big advocate for privatizing the postal service uh, mm -hmm. from the 1970s forward. So all of these horrible things that we're seeing under DeJoy um, are coming about in part with you know suggestions and collaboration from, uh, from some of those organizations, yes. It's funny you mentioned the postal service because as I was reading your book this summer, it's sort of, every chapter, every came true in the real world every week with Trump's assault on the Postal Service and so on and so on. The, the book seemed uh, prescient in that sense. 
Um, and now here we are in the current moment with the, the battle over replacing Justice Ginsburg on yes. the Supreme Court. Um, and, and, and we're at this moment where President Trump has appointed so many federal judges, many of them products of the Federalist Society. Right. Um, what we see on the federal courts, is this a, a lasting victory for the Koch donor network and that movement? It's probably the single most important piece of their strategy was mm. to transform the judiciary. And again, this is something they've been working on for years now, since the 1970s. Uh, and Charles Koch you know, has said that he provided seed money for the Federalist Society, uh, continuing funding thereafter too, but also seed money for that, something called the Institute for Justice, um, which was be pushing for Clarence Thomas's nomination, um, mm. among other things, and has pushed for this, what you know they call it the constitution in exile, meaning the pre-New Deal constitution so here again, I think this is a, a place for if there are um, uh, journalists on the call. I know you've retired, so unfortunately we can't we can't have you doing this, Dave. But um, uh, I think sometimes people follow what um, what the talk is kind of on the street or what people are saying. So so with this particular nomination, the discussion is all about Roe v. Wade, right? And that's you know certainly an important issue and something that most people are concerned with. But what people really need to understand is that the, the judges that were selected by Donald McGahn and his you know partners at the Federalist Society and pushed through by the Trump administration, that's only one piece of what they're going for. They are going for the entire constitutional principle, the entire um, uh, 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 history of jurisprudence that has supported regulation since the New Deal. So mm -hmm. that regulation enables us to control corporate malfeasance, enables us to um, strengthen the citizenry against these big uh, uh, concentrations of private economic power. It is what enabled civil rights victories, that administrative state, the same thing for women's rights, the same thing for lesbian, you know, LGBTQ, um, for environmental regulation. So it's not just that they're coming after one group right, or one victory, they are coming after the entire substructure that holds all this up. So that's terrifying, I agree. And it was not fun to, to, to start piecing this together as I was working on this. But the one thing I can say is that um, it seems almost perverse, but it's almost like they have created the foundations for the coalition we need <laughs> to reclaim our country and to finally renew our democracy, because there is not a single group that has organized collectively to do anything in the 20th century who is not going to be adversely affected by this project if it succeeds, and they are being adversely affected now. I've sometimes gone where I've been um, speaking in cities to representatives of you know a whole range of different organizations and as an icebreaker just said you know um you know tell us your name and you know what, what group you're working with and how the coke network is affecting your work and there's not a single group from any kind of organization that isn't seeing whatever the nature of their justice or reclamation or what you know whatever the, the the work they do not seeing a negative impact already from the success of this project so i think by seeing ourselves together as people who rely on a functioning democracy, an open democracy, a democracy in which each vote counts the same, where there isn't a, you know, a stream of dark money and toxic ideas uh, flooding things, I think we, we can begin to see ourselves together in the way that we will need to be to defeat this and to be able to break through and, and uh, reform and reclaim democracy. You have a section in the book where you talk about the economic experiment that took place in the country of Chile. We have some folks in the audience who've obviously read the book, and I was also fascinated by that passage because there was that period when Chile was held up as the model for privatizing social security and was championed by politicians on the right in the United States to say, see, it works. Mm -hmm. In your book, you sort of tell the sequel to that, which was not a pretty story. Um, talk just a little bit. I didn't know what you had in the book about the influence of Buchanan and his peers uh, on that um, libertarian economic experiment in Chile. And I wasn't fully aware of sort of the unpleasant chapter that followed that privatization push. Can you talk just a little bit about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, many people who um, uh, follow uh, Chilean history or who were involved in human rights in the 1970s have heard about the influence of, they actually called themselves the Chicago Boys, you know, Pinochet's mm -hmm. uh, team of advisors, and many of them had studied at the University of Chicago. But the role that James Buchanan played in advising the constitution that the Pinochet government put into effect was actually a shock. Even my, my in graduate school, I was a minor in Latin American history. And my professor, my advisor for that minor was a, 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 a historian of, of Latin America named Steve Stern, who's at the University of Wisconsin. He wrote three volumes on the Pinochet government and historical memory about it and the transition and the fight and did not know about, you know, Buchanan's work. So, so this is something that I think, you know, our eyes were trained elsewhere. People weren't like they knew the constitution was anti-democratic, but not this Buchanan kind of lineage. So that constitution, Buchanan was actually brought in by uh, the dictatorship and its business allies to advise on this constitution constitution and basically they structured a constitution with um, these kinds of rules that I was talking about before that would make it so it could never become too democratic and so mm -hmm. any popularly elected uh, government could not actually get their hands around the economy to address all the inequality, the privatization, the other things the dictatorship uh, had done. Uh, and that happened to Michelle Bachelet, who was president um, in 1913, or 2013, 2013, when there were these huge street demonstrations about the problems that came from privatized higher education, healthcare, and so forth. And she realized that even having won two thirds of the vote, she couldn't act because she said, Chile has a constitution of locks and bolts with two thirds of the people. But, and more actually wanting the changes. And what's really interesting about that too is also since the book came out, um, there were huge, huge street demonstrations in 2019 um, where people finally realized that like the constitution was the problem. The constitution is what's holding them up. So they're actually having a referendum on this constitution. I think it's October 24th. Um, and I was actually just uh, contacted by someone whose uh, family had left Chile when she was 18. Mm -hmm. They were refugees and she somehow found my book, but I'm going to be doing a, one of these events for a number of Chilean expats, um, some politicians and journalists in the country uh, and interested others because this is a story they need to know as they go into this plebiscite to on whether to revise the constitution, they have to understand how it got so messed up and what might be done to correct it. So it's a continue, as you say, mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, historians are usually were explaining the past. And it's just been absolutely eerie uh, for me to see how much the book did end up kind of predicting what we're dealing with. I actually, I wish, I so wish that I'd been wrong. I can't tell you. I would give anything to have been wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you've painted a rather dire picture of events in Chile and a rather dire forecast of what could happen in this country and what is happening in this country. So let me turn to the current moment and just ask, Ordinary Americans who lack the financial means of Charles Koch and his peers, what can ordinary Americans do to fight back and to protect majority rule and a functioning democracy? Yes, that is the all important question. Uh, and I think that the single most important near term uh, thing is to realize that as important as all the different issues we're facing up, facing are and all the pent up needs, we must put structural democracy reform at the top of our agendas. We must deal with this problem of dark money in politics. We must get automatic voter registration to get rid of the incentives to suppress the vote. We must work for independent redistricting so that voters are choosing their elected officials rather than elected officials choosing their voters. Um, those are some of the things that we need to do. And I will say one of the things that's been incredibly heartening to me since publishing this book is uh, coming to know the, the vast array of Americans and states and communities around the country like Minnesotans for uh, clean elections and common cause and you know, the indivisible groups, the women's march groups, the movement for black lives, the unions, the environmental groups, there are so many people who are all realizing that we are at an all hands on deck emergency for democracy. Um, and that this current administration as one public health nurse uh, uh, put it in a letter to me, many people are realizing, not all, but is, as she put it, the tumor, not the cancer. And she said, 
you have to get rid of the tumor, but we must deal with the cancer that brought us to this nadir in our public life. And anyone who was watching last night knows that things have gone malignant, right? So we must deal with the immediate situation and do everything we can to have the greatest possible turnout uh, in these, these very difficult COVID conditions. But as soon and as we do that, and as we're doing that, we also have to be working on these vitally important, urgent democracy reforms to make sure that all of our votes are counted, that they count equally, and that we can unrig the rules that have been so systematically rigged from the other side. I'd like to circle back on that in a moment, but we have a rather specific question from someone in the audience, uh, which touches on the Citizens United uh, court decision. Would you place that among the, uh, 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 the problems uh, uh, that we need to tackle? Oh, absolutely, I would. Um, and again, this Supreme Court conservative majority that comes out of this um, deep world of kind of right wing uh, corporate money and power has been systematically um, uh, uh, essentially capturing the courts for corporate interests and undermining um, popular uh, uh, power and well-being in a variety of ways. So I would um, put maybe another book on people's radar screens, and that is by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island, who's a very thoughtful um, uh, senator and uh, historically minded and a former um, attorney general, I mean, uh, state attorney general himself. And he, he, he wrote this book called Captured, the Corporate Infiltration of American Democracy to show what he has experienced, you know, to convey to readers what he's experienced but he also has a website called Captured Courts, where he has shown systematically um, what the Roberts, Courts, uh, Roberts Court, Supreme Court is doing to our democracy in basically in the service of corporations, systematically, consistently um, overriding uh, workers' rights, over uh, uh, undermining environmental and other protections. Uh, so, yeah. I forgot what the question was. <laughs> no, 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 that's not really. Citizens United, but let me broaden oh, it. Oh, Citizens again. United, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that, and because it was a Supreme Court decision, the only way that we can address that is through a constitutional amendment. Um, so there is a group called End Citizens United, uh, and there are some other uh, groups who are working on a constitutional amendment um, uh, to overturn that decision. So I think that that is a very good idea, not only, um, uh, you know, if it succeeds, but also because of the educational value of helping people understand what this huge um, uh, uh, hose, fire hose of dark money is doing to our politics. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, to go back to the broad picture again, if it isn't too pessimistic, too gloomy, what would America begin to look like five years from now, 10 years from now, if the, I'll call it the Koch project, mm -hmm. if their agenda prevails beyond what it's already accomplished. Yeah, well, what I think- What's going to look like? For the environment, we're already seeing some of that, right? More fires, more, horrible hurricanes, more um, uh, growing seasons undermined by extreme weather, drought, flooding, you know, all of this craziness that's being caused by uh, climate change. So, so we're already seeing that, but it's going to escalate. In fact, in California this year, I think they said they had, what was it, like um, six of the worst fires in the last 50 years were just last year or something like that. So this real escalation of, of the, the chaos um, in our weather systems and the toll that has on human beings, uh, but also escalating inequality, you know, more and more people cut off from Medicaid, Medicaid, you know, you could go on. I actually, in my um, conclusion in Democracy in Chains, I quote this Coke funded professor who has been working with Charles Koch at George Mason uh, for more than 25 years now, he actually describes this world that we're going to, to be entering um, and says that with the extreme wage polarization developing, right, this growing chasm between haves and have nots, he said we should expect to see favela-like housing in American cities, favelas like the slums in Brazil up along the hillsides because people won't be able to afford the quality of housing they have. He also said that um, uh, 
he said, Texas is the future for a lot of us. Get ready. You know, like if you find your housing too expensive in, in Minneapolis, well, don't have a living wage ordinance. Don't do anything through the political process because they'll block that. All you have left is to move to Texas, right, to favela housing. And then he actually said, too, that um, Americans wouldn't, or some Amer most Americans, something like that, wouldn't be able to accept the, expect the same water quality and public services they had. And this is before Flint, but Charles Koch worked, his office was staffing the organization that pushed for those emergency managers that shifted the water supply of Flint. So you wanna know what we're gonna be looking at? Look at Flint, look at that extreme weather, look at the inequality, look at people facing the COVID crisis with no insurance. That's what we'd be looking at. So someone in the audience asked specifically about COVID and what would the Koch philosophy about COVID be, but let me broaden that just a bit. Do you think we're at a moment where these disastrous events that we're seeing in our country and around the world begin to remind people why we have a government that takes collective action in the first place, public health, environmental regulation, um, uh, voter, uh, voter registration, um, do you see any hope, a tide turning, that we see why we work together and why we have a government that helps everybody? Yes, I very much do, Dave, and I th I'm glad that you raised this because I think this has been um, a, a kind of a almost a slap and a kind of wake up to us, as you're saying, to realize where would we be without public health systems? You know, where we see where we are without a functioning government that the Trump administration had all these resources at its disposal that they could have used. I mean, of course, some people would have died, you know, as we tried to get on top of this, but 200,000, you know, putting the states into competition with one another and then taking their resources. I mean, this is, again, that Koch philosophy, weaken the federal government, put the states into competition, um, and have people provide for themselves. And so, uh, so the, in terms of the, the COVID crisis itself, um, the Desmog blog, which is a great source for um, you know, disinformation, particularly around climate issues, but they uh, tracked the sources of COVID denial, you know, especially in these initial months to say it wasn't serious, it was just the flu, blah, 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 blah. Well, lo and behold, it's the same funders who are funding climate denial, <laughs> including the Cokes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I recommend um, Desmog blog as a source of information for that. Also, uh, True North Research has had um, great stuff, and they've also shown that many of the groups that were leading these reopen protests, like those ugly ones in Michigan with these armed you know, thugs basically at the state legislature demanding that they reopen businesses <clears throat> and stop these public health measures, you know, many of these are, they're like the fringe libertarians, but they are on the spigot of support from these donor networks. And also um, I learned from uh, True North Research that um, uh, the Americans for Prosperity was funding some of the litigation to try to deny governors the power to close businesses um, and ensure mask wearing. So again, this, I have described thought of libertarianism, frankly, I've come to think of it as a death cult. You know, it is, it's such an extreme um, um, uh, ideology, it, it, you know, one of these world changing messianic ideologies that's extremely rigid. They allow no exceptions. If anything goes wrong, it's just because you didn't apply their cure hard enough. So, I mean, if they had their way, we'd have all our businesses open and we'd have tons of people dying just with the Texas governor who is, you know, a Coke, Coke uh, politician said, you know, so what? We lose some senior citizens, right? right? Let's, let's get our economy going. So, I mean, it's that, which to me is the same philosophy as James Buchanan articulated in 1959 to deny black school children access to equal education. He actually sent a letter to the legislators with, a, with his plan that said they were issuing this proposal, letting the chips fall where they may. And that's how these po folks think, letting the chips fall where they may. Any human cost is bearable because it's not gonna be on them to get their ideas through. So whether it's COVID or it's school desegregation or it's social security privatization or Medicaid, or, you know, they, they are, um, and of course they're the folks who have blocked Medicaid expansion um, and attacked the Affordable Care Act since its creation. So yeah, this is, 
if they were to succeed in achieving their agenda, it would be the most radical dystopia that I think any of us can imagine, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I think it's also very important that um, people of faith know about this, um, because I think we are really at a moment of um, dramatic, uh, a dra dramatic turning point in terms of our values, right? Of who we are as a country, what we stand for, what we owe one another, and what what kind of you know community and country we want to be. And I think that we need people, you know, not who are dogmatic or whatever, but people who speak from a deep place of values, as the best in every religious tradition does, to say we are bound together. We care for one another. We look out for the, the 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 weak and the vulnerable. Care for the sick. Help the homeless. You know, try to lift up those whose voices have been held down. The best of every religious tradition has that, and this cope uh, project is against the best in every religious tradition. So I think the more that people understand that, understand the scale of of the challenge we face. Um, the better equipped we are to address it, but also in a way, the more promising the, the transformation that could come of this struggle in just the way that you were saying, Dave, like this COVID crisis has really taught us the whole planet, <laughs> we're connected now, right? And, and we depend on workers for everything that, that happens in our lives. And we at least some of us have realized how, you know, that the kinship we right. have and that we need to protect um, one another and those who are most vulnerable and those who are taking the greatest risks. So again, this is potentially a time of, of incredible renewal, but for that to happen, I think we all need to set to work and start rowing in the same direction, you know, and realizing how much we share. I'd like to circle back to that point in just a moment, but here's a question uh, about the current political environment. There's much concern about disinformation circulating in social media and Facebook and um, misleading foreign meddling in the election. Um, are the Koch brothers part of that? Are the Koch brothers adept at uh, uh, social media? Oh, yeah. The yeah. <laughs> They're uh, adept at all kinds of media. If you go to something called Prager University, it pumps out these videos, all of these Koch funded professors uh, at campuses around the country that are kind of modeled on this George Mason prototype. They're all pushed to be involved in social media, to have blog sites, to have web pages, to be out there, to be doing uh, op-eds, to be speaking to the media. So yes, very, very strong uh, media presence. I will say, I just got a note today that um, this, uh, uh, collective project from the Social Science Research Council that I was involved in um, uh, has a book that's coming out and they're actually, the press is rushing it out early. It's gonna be out October 15th and <laughs> it's called The Disinformation Age. Um, and so I, and I was thinking the essay I have in this is in this volume is on um, something I didn't focus on quite as directly in the book. And I did some more research for this essay, but it's about how <clears throat> they have used disinformation as a strategy since the beginning. Um, and I just kind of lay out the case very systematically, um, showing also that they were behind the attacks on the Clinton healthcare plan, <laughs> but we didn't know the Cokes at that time. So nobody really realized it, but when you look, it was their group, Citizens for a Sound Economy. So anyway, I uh, was going to break out my essay in that and just photocopy it and send it to folks who are on my mailing list. Um, right. So I will certainly do that. And Kanye and Ken would have it and, and could share it with others. But the whole volume is really worth reading. Um, there are some uh, pieces by communication scholars, including this brilliant uh, one at Harvard, Yokai Benkler, who uh, did this major research project on social media in the 2016 election and thought that they were going to be showing Russian influence. What they actually found is that the disinformation coming from American uh, organizations like Fox and Breitbart in particular is far worse than anything that's coming in yeah. from overseas or that has you know, at this point. So yeah, lots of interesting stuff in that, but yeah, definitely look for that, that book. Yeah. Um, yeah. That sounds great. Love to read that. So if you were advising Joe Biden right now, what are two or three things that you would put on his agenda uh, on his platform that the next president must do to push back against this effort and to reclaim democracy? 
Uh, well, the House, uh, when, when the Democrats won the House in 2018, um, they uh, adopted um, uh, House Bill one, as House Bill 1, their first item of business, st a structural democracy reform passage oh. uh, package. So I would say, make sure that goes through, you know, make that item number one, and you could even strengthen it uh, even more. But that is also to deal with transparency, um, voting, um, corporate donations. It could be stronger, but it's definitely a, a step in the right direction. So I would say that. Um, I would also say, um, the party's base, the Democratic Party's base, are the people who are doing the heavy lifting. You know, the 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 um, particularly the young people pushing for action on the climate, who are you know working with people who have been in those trenches for years. But the young people have brought this incredible energy and vision for the Green uh, New Deal. Um, I I would say that is crucial um, because also I think if we're not addressing the inequality and the kind of need to remake our country to let in the levels of threat, you know, address people's needs. We, we're not going to get out of this this um, ditch that we're in. So I would say, you know, for starters, those would be two pretty huge things. Um, and then also uh, um, de dealing with the, the way that corporations have been rigging politics uh, and the courts um, along the lines of what I was saying, you know, Sheldon Whitehouse has been uh, exposing. If you started to deal with those three things, um, unrigging the rules of democracy, you know, acting on the climate, but in a way that creates jobs. So it's not a zero sum, you know, it's all of us going forward together um, and unringing our courts. That that would be a pretty, pretty healthy package to put us on, on the right road. Great, great. Well, Professor McLean, this has been a great conversation, extremely stimulating. Let me wind it down with a final question. Okay because we're, we're, um, we have tremendous audience interest in this. Yeah. We have people champing at the bit. And let me just ask, you know, what are two or three things that ordinary folks can do between now and the election mm -hmm. and going forward to push back against this uh, liber ultra libertarian effort and to protect our democracy? Yeah, I saw that question in the Q&A and loved it. It's my favorite kind of question because it's the most important. What do we do? Um, I would say that uh, we can all kind of take a deep breath <laughs> and do an inventory of our the people that are in our networks, the organizations we're connected with, um, the talents we have, the passions we have. Because I think if each person on this call, and we have 177 now, <laughs> were to do that, were to really sit and think about that and realize that the way this cause is advancing is through darkness and stealth right? That when we bring the light of sunshine on this, this will not stand because nobody wants to live in the world they're creating, but we don't, we have to know about it in order to stop it. So I think um, spreading the word, education, letting people know what's going on, following up, say on journalists, you know, if somebody interviews one of these people and they say, we want to reform social security, call that journalist and say, do you know that they actually want to get rid of it? Could you ask the next question? You know, so I think we can do things like that. Um, letting people know um, uh, following up on our, particularly our local media, most people trust their local media much more than they do national media at this point. So be active, be visible, send those letters to the editor, you know, make the phone calls um, and get active. And that's why I was saying, think about your networks. You know, most of us, you know, we have friendship networks, we have family networks, some of us have faith networks, some of us have alumni groups we care about, some of us have clubs of different kinds. All these domains, people need to understand what is happening to our country and approach it in a calm and deliberate manner, but with, you know, with, with the passion that it deserves and the urgency uh, that it deserves. And I think if each of us also were to think about within those larger networks, are there three people? Are there five people? Are there 10 people I could talk to to help them understand how important this election is and turnout in this election for the state offices as well as uh, the um, uh, federal uh, positions and, and try to kind of together move people into action and create communities of encouragement and support. I think that would be great. Can I share a little quote? I was cleaning off my, well, it's not perfect. Yeah. 
as you can see, but I was trying to clean off my desk a little bit for you all tonight and dealing with some old papers. And I happened to come across um, this quote from the philosopher Richard Rorty. It was really uncanny timing, especially after last night. But he says, it's a part of a longer quote, but this is the part I'll share. You have to be loyal to a dream country rather than to the one you wake up to every morning. And I think that is just so important, right? Because, you know, all of us know that we have some amazing traditions in this country, right? You know, from the abolition movement um, that, that uh, ended up, you know, um, in enabling the enslaved to gather the, you know, to finally uh, end slavery, the workers movement you know, women, environmentalists, native peoples, all of these, you know, have, have open, you know, have realized so much more of the promise of we the people have tried to create a perfect union. We made such progress that people like Charles Koch got scared. <laughs> and they thought, we're not going to be running this anymore if these people keep getting this power. So I think we need to realize how much we've achieved um, in those independent struggles, but also together, and, and, and realize that if we can dedicate ourselves again, as hard as this might seem now, this is nothing compared to what the abolition movement faced, folks right? We have so many resources. We have so many people. We have so much power. We have so much cultural talent. Like we can do this, but we need to, again, hold to that dream country, not to the one that comes across the radio in the morning. And sometimes if we have to turn out, tune out that noise just to get to the, you know, calling those voters, doing those things we need to do, that's what we need to do. And it will be more gratifying than doom scrolling. I can tell you as some who is, someone who has like deliberately con uh, contained my doom scrolling so I can shift to phone banking. And it's a lot more fun to talk to your fellow citizens. So I, I think I'd leave that there. Well, great. Thank you so much. Professor McLean, you've, you've taken us to the brink of despair and you've brought us back again into a sunnier possibility. So on behalf of all of the folks here in Minnesota, I want to thank you for a really stimulating, really edifying conversation. And I'm so glad we could all be with you uh, tonight. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Dave, for being just, you know, coming up with such fabulous questions and really cutting to the pith of things from the, the looks of the Q&A. It sounds like people really enjoyed it. And I'd love to see those questions if the hosts want to send them to me or something. Um, sure. And I think maybe some of them at least will be answered in the book. Um, but uh, yeah. Oh, one more on the universities. There's a group yeah. called Uncoke My Campus. <laughs> you can go to their website and get information about the, the Coke presence on campuses and the organizing being done against it. So I would share that with uh, folks who are um, in the Q&A with those questions. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Good, good Thank luck. You. And uh, you. hopefully we'll, we'll, things will be looking better uh, in, later in, this in week. about four weeks. Yeah. Thanks so much. It could be longer. We should be prepared for that too. It's going to take a long time to count those ballots. But thank you so much, everyone. Good luck. Bye.